Good evening and welcome to the Ombudsman program. My name is Diane Wellborn. I am the Ombudsman and I will be your host for this evening's program. Before we get started, I'd like to remind the viewers that this is a call-in show and so we welcome your participation through calling in with your questions or your comments. Now I'd like to introduce our viewers tonight to Dr. Wu, who is with the Department of Geology at the University of Dayton and has been there for some number of years. So thank you for coming on the program tonight and welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, it's my pleasure. And you certainly bring a wealth of information to our topic tonight, which is what does climate change mean for us? Um, we were chatting before the program, and it seems like every news account has something new to tell us about what is happening to our changing environment. So I have many questions, and you have many answers, and so we're just going to go ahead and get started with that. I'll try okay. my best. Oh, you're going to do wonderfully. And I thank you for bringing some slides for us as well. So uh, I'd like to ask you to give us an overview of what is uh, what's happening with climate change uh, so far in the state of the studies today. And I think you'd probably like to start with the first slide with sure. that. Okay, we'll put up the first slide now, please. Here we go. Okay, well, it's not a very exciting slide, but uh, we'll get started. I think I want to take this opportunity to provide a little bit more details about the phenomena we know as global warming. Usually you hear people about talking about, oh, CO2 as a blanket, but why is it a blanket? Why does it cause um, global warming? So here is just a little bit details. And so basically, the Earth is warm to support life because we receive energy from the sun. So the slides, it's a simple slide that shows that the sun's energy, which is kind of like um, orange, and, uh, and the uh, coming in, and the sun's energy is largely like uh, visible light. And in warming up the earth, as the, war as the earth warms up, it will also radiate energy out. But the sun's en incoming energy and the earth's outgoing energy are different. They also like have different flavors. And one is um, the sun's energy is mostly light and the earth energy is mostly heat. And uh, in terms of um, the scientific term, they have different wavelength. So the earth, if the earth does not have an atmosphere, the outgoing would balance the incoming and give us a temperature. But this temperature would be a lot colder. But because of the atmosphere, and then particularly because certain gases in the atmosphere, they basically let all the sun's energy in, but the outgoing energy get absorbed by certain gases. Yes. And that's what causes the additional energy that's being intercepted. That's why it serves as a blanket. Okay. And uh, most of the atmosphere, like 99% of the atmosphere doesn't do this, doesn't do anything. They let the incoming in, they let outgoing out. And uh, this very small portion of it, what we call a greenhouse gas, and um, they in particular can actually absorb the outgoing heat and adding all this energy back into the earth, make it warmer. So this is a phenomenon we call greenhouse effect. And the main greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide and water vapor. And that's the most important thing. The, um, because of that, along the Earth's history, if we have more carbon dioxide, the Earth tends to be warmer. And if we have less carbon dioxide, the Earth tends to be cooler. And this is not something new. It's been operating throughout the Earth four and a half billion years, okay? So can we, if we can have the next slide? We certainly can, excellent. So this slide basically shows that's going back 400,000 years and the red line is carbon dioxide and the blue line is temperature. And you'll see at least for the, for the um, 400,000 years and the higher the level of CO2, the warmer the planet, the higher the temperature. And they actually, they correlate very well. And that is exactly the uh, greenhouse effect. So 
this is something that's been, that's a natural phenomena that's been operating. Now what we are worrying about is the addition of carbon dioxide caused by human activities. And if you're looking at the historical trend, the carbon dioxide goes up and down naturally. And, but within, this is, shows 400,000 years, but actually up to a million years about. And uh, the natural range of variation is about 180 to about 300. 300. And uh, that is roughly the level before the Industrial Revolution. That's about like mid 19th century. We're at about 280. And so that's where we sort of naturally sit CO2. But since then, because of the use of fossil fuels, the consumption of fossil fuels, the CO2 level has been steadily increasing. And right now, we're at four, over 400 ppm. So this is way over the natural range of variation. Uh, by 100, it's over by 100. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. yes. And sometimes people wonder how you can get all this information. And I just want to throw you a slide. The next slide, please. Thank you. So this is how we get, at least that chart is where that chart's from. We get this information from drilling the ice core. And uh, so the ice is basically the ancient layered snow which traps ancient air bubbles. And then those ancient air bubbles, we can measure CO2, and then there are ways to infer temperature as well. So that's how this is. This is the uh, very famous ice core that people drew from Antarctica. Right. It's, that's a remarkable picture, isn't it? Yes. It's the yes. ice core that's taller than most of the people there. Yeah, that's just. <laughs> this is going back how many years? This going back to the, the Vostok goes back about 800,000 years. OK. The ice core itself is 1,000 meters. Yes, They're just yes. in those segments. In segments, yes, yes, of course. Good, good. When did, uh, when did academics and scientists begin to start noticing these changes and studying them? Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, show you some of the uh, data we gathered. Okay. And then From scientists. These cores. Yes. Okay. And uh, some other things as well. You know, scientists, whenever they start thinking there might be a problem, the first thing they do is go take a measurement. That's yes. what we do. Yes. So because of the close correlation, and then because as people start to get concerned about uh, how human might affect the atmosphere, hence the climate, and uh, starting from 1959, we set up at the first uh, CO2 monitoring station. And uh, since then, we have a continuous measurement of CO2 in the atmosphere. And this is what, I found, what we found. OK, so we're the ready. next slide. Yes. Excellent. So starting from 1959, and you see the, the, the red lines shows the monthly value, so they show the wiggles shows the very regular seasonal variations of CO2 because of the plants. Yes. When they fall, they don't absorb as much, so the CO2 varies seasonally. Despite the seasonal level, you see a very, very steady increase through the period of observation. And then going from about two, three, 310, go all the way up, we are now at about 402, 402 ppm. So there's a steady increase. And because of the physics, we understand about the greenhouse effect, you're just going to expect that temperature is going to rise as well. But of course, temperature does not behave as well like CO2. You know, we sometimes have cold years and warm years, so we have ups and downs. But in general, you will see the trend. And uh, the next slide, Okay, please. we'll have the next slide, which is going to show us more about <laughs> the impact of the temperature. Thank you. So here is basically the temperature trend. And uh, so despite the ups and downs, so we sometimes see the cold, cold years and warm years, right? And despite that, the zero line is the average level. So each bar is the year deviate from the average. Mm -hmm. And you'll see most of the cooler than average years occurs in the first half of the 20th century. By the way, the data start in 1880 all the way to 12, um, 20, I think 15 or seven, uh, 16. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that towards particularly after 1980, all the years were above 
above average. Right. So that shows a very clear warming trend. So basically, people say, well, there's ups and downs, and there's colder years and warm years. And, um, but when you start to get consistently warm and warm years, like after 2000, so we have about 16, 17 years of temperature records after 2000, among of them, among them, 15 years among the hottest 15 years ever recorded with the instrument record. Right. So it's like rolling a dice. If you, if you're continuing getting six, you know your dice is loaded. Mm -hmm. There's something systematic happening here. Right. Not just by chance. No, not clearly with this type of graph that shows the increase. Yeah. Excellent. So about the historical, the, the right. historical perspective. And um, so getting back to that question, it's very interesting, I should ask. A lot of people think that the discovery of global warming is something very recent, that people started to talk about it in, in let's say, last several decades, three decades, at most four decades. But this is not true. Actually, the phenomena as global warming or greenhouse effect has a very well, pretty long history. So I'll show you some important people in the timeline of Good. global warming. And here they are. Here they are. And the first person who talk about this possibility is a uh, French mathematician called Fourier. So in his 90, uh, sorry, 1824 paper, he basically did a very basic, simple energy balance. So if incoming energy balanced outgoing energy, and according to his calculation, the Earth should be um, zero degrees on average Fahrenheit. So we're talking about Fahrenheit. Right now, the average temperature of the Earth is a very comfortable 59, 60 degrees. So he said, well, how come if I do this calculation, it's only zero degrees? So he basically speculated must be the atmosphere that is doing something to the Earth. But he didn't specify what it is. And then there came the John Tyndall, who's the uh, British um, chemist. And uh, so in the paper published in 1859, he was, the, he was the one who did all the, who did a very detailed experiment and uh, measurement. And he's the one who came up to see, okay, most of the atmosphere didn't do anything. And there's only tiny, tiny little bit of the atmosphere. And most important, CO2. And, uh, and water vapor. So those gases are the ones that are responsible for warming of the Earth, to so keep Earth warmer than zero than degrees. Zero. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so he's the one who isolated those gases. So he called them greenhouse gases. And then, towards the end of the century, Svan Arrhenius, he's the, um, I think it's Norwegian, it's anyway, a, it sounds such. Yes. yes. So <laughs> he's from one of the Nordic countries. Mm -hmm. He's a Norwegian chemist, and he's the one who started to realize that if CO two plays such a role, and where they were at the time, we were in the middle of this industrial revolution that used a lot of fossil fuels and then emit a lot of CO twos. Are we capable of changing the climate? And he's the first first person who came up with the mathematic model basically predicted global warming um, based on human activities. Okay. We have a caller that uh, would like to ask us a question or sure. join something. Yes, you're on the air. Go ahead with your question, please. Yes, thank you. What a wonderfully timely and relevant uh, show. Thank you very much. Um, I saw today that there was a report uh, issued by 1,700 scientists today uh, in a journal called Bioscience, uh, where the scientists issued what they called a second notice to humanity about the damage uh, being done to the environment by um, carbon fuel emission. And I noticed that most of the scientists who were quoted in the study were university scientist uh, like uh, your guest, 
the, the professor there tonight, I know that there are some um, states in the United States, like the state of Florida, that prohibit um, state officials from even mentioning the word climate change or global warming. Um, so my question is, um, for the professor, uh, how do we understand the um, politics of uh, climate science? Um, who can speak authoritatively and, and who is being censored? Thank you. Thank you for that challenging question. <laughs> it's, uh, um, it's, it's right to the topic. Are you familiar with the bioscience second notice, the, the journal second notice that the caller referred to? I have not. I have okay. not read it. Okay. All right. Good. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, this, the, the question that he's asking about um, prohibiting speech about this, I'd just like to toss that out to you and see what you'd like to respond being in the university community yourself. <laughs> wow, that's, yeah. a, that's a challenging question. Uh, I think personally I have not uh, met such political pressures in my own research. I count myself as lucky. Mm -hmm. and, but I have met people, there's a very famous scientist. I, I used to be a um, postdoc at Penn State and there's a very famous scientist at Penn State called Michael Mann. And uh, he, was, he was one of the leading authors of one of the uh, IPCC climate report. And I know at certain times his computer was co uh, confiscated. confiscated yes. And uh, he was under investigation for, for, for various things. But those in investigations were initiated um, through, uh, by members of Congress not mm -hmm. by scientific communities. I see. And then throughout all these, um, nothing, no wrongdoing were found, but he was constantly um, hassled. Ch and challenged. Challenged, yes, yes. yes professionally by, yes. I, I, by others. Yes, okay. I think he wrote a book about it. Yes. Oh my goodness, yeah. well, yes. we'll have to let our viewers check that out for, them, yes. for themselves There's though. But definitely. Yes, but there are definitely um, people that don't want to talk about this particular problem and I think we'll circle back to that toward the end of the program. Yes. yes. Um, did you have further comments about the academics, those who we had pictured? Are we ready to move? Um, just, uh, so those are the very early right. um, um, pioneers right. in the theory of uh, global warming yeah. and uh, and then for various academic reasons and non-academic reasons most of these were forgotten for for um, for half of the 20th century and the recent revival is actually quite interesting I thought the some of the viewers might interested to know some of the first detailed measurement of CO2 in the, uh, in the atmosphere did not made by academics but rather by the military. Okay. So after the World War II, after the World War II, the U.S. Air Force was developing um, heat-seeking missiles. So they're basically using the heat admitted by various various targets to guide the missiles. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, we know that CO2 uh, absorb heat, and whether it's from the Earth or from an airplane, mm -hmm. and uh, so during this process they have to adjust the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere in order to get better and more accurate targeting. And uh, they thought they would make a measurement and then make the same adjustment, but then they found that each year actually have, they actually have to change the measurement. So they're, the f well, um, they're one of the first who noticed that the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is actually changing. It's changing. It's increasing. Interesting. That is a very interesting point. Yes. There are many people here that would appreciate that with the presence of Wright Pat and many that may have already known this, but I did not. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that with us. We have another caller that has okay. a question for us. Sure. So I'd like to hear your question. You're on the air. Hi. Um, I was wanting to know about as um, I've heard on the NPR um, news reports, our, our president has um, certainly made it very well known, and I know this may be a little political, but has um, made it known that he believes that climate change or global warming is a hope. And uh, certainly the plan is to repeal 
um, our former President uh, Barack Obama's um, regulations. And I was just wondering um, if the professor could uh, comment on if they have no replacement for what is currently um, in place, what impact would that have on current research or research moving forward, um, looking at um, climate change and, and global warming? Thank you very much for that question. Were you able to hear what she said? Not very uh, well. Okay. No, uh, yes, I will do my best to capture her picture. It has to do with regulations in the United States, but I'm sure that you, you work internationally, so you could address any that you want. But regulations that have been put in in order to, by the previous administration, in order to try to contain some of these these gases and mm -hmm. water vapors that's making this and what if those are now changed or do not exist anymore what is the impact so <laughs> um, I think most of the regulations are still in place and okay. I do hope that the present um, present administration will see um, we'll see the reason to keep them in place. Okay. And uh, I sometimes feel that if you are the only country against all the rest of the world, you probably should think about it, and then maybe you are on the wrong side of the history. Okay. And um, yeah, I can, I can talk more about um, when we talk about the impact of the uh, international treaties. Yes, okay, we will do, we'll move to that now. I want to thank our callers and encourage others if you have questions. Now we're gonna uh, move slightly and talk a little bit more about some of the regulations that the last caller brought up by talking about some of the international treaties and accords that have been put in place in, in response. So um, take it away, Dr. Wu. Sure. Um, the, uh, the main international, um, international agreement, the, 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 the first major one, and it still um, continues to um, uh, operate, is the UN um, Framework Convention on Climate Change. Mm -hmm. And uh, that convention was adopted in the Rio Earth Summit, if you, if you still remember, that's yes. a huge event, yes. and in 1992. Right. And that convention does not have uh, legally binding, any legally binding um, uh, guidelines in there. However, it's set up, I think it's very important because it set up a forum for all the countries to come together and to discuss the, uh, the progress and discuss the impact and discuss how to move forward. So even though the, the, the convention itself does not have does not have a um, does not have any legally binding right. regulations, but it provides the, it basically get all the countries together once a year. So they are they are meeting once a year to discuss the progress in climate change, and also they try to come up with some legally binding agreement, further agreement under this convention. And uh, that happened in 1997, so that's the first one, that's the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol basically set legally binding targets for developed countries because they recognize the, the different needs of between developed countries and developing countries. And so they set the target for developed country only. And after that, it was uh, the next one is the Cancun Agreement um, passed in 2010. So the Cancun Agreement basically set a target for everybody, saying that we should not, um, we should con we should limit the increase of temperature by two degrees, because that's um, what many scientists think that beyond which in irreversible damage could be well, will occur or take place. Mm -hmm. or take place. Yeah. So that's the Cancun Agreement, and and then the next big step is the Paris Agreement. Right. The Paris Agreement was adopted in 2000, uh, 2015, and it basically set legally binding targets for all countries, but uh, the countries come up with their own targets. And uh, some people 
I know there are a lot of cynicism about those international agreements, right. but I do think they are very important. First of all, they bring people together, at least make people aware that there are problems. You can't start to deal with problems until you admit there is a problem mm -hmm. that we have to work together. And, uh, and also, I mean, believe it or not, some countries are taking actions. It's not, it's just an empty agreement. And actually, I was in China last, just last month, September. In September, China announced a major decision that they are making plans to phase out all gas-powered vehicles. So people think, I mean, here people think that's not possible. We're still, we're still, we're still talking about saving the coal industry. We're still talking about having the traditional auto industry, but. China is talking about phasing out all gasoline and diesel powered vehicles. And he's, China is not alone. And France and Britain already has, has the um, agreement, has the, um, some kind of legal actions. They're going to phase out all gasoline and diesel powered vehicles by 2040. And they're also going to phase out all coal powered power plants. And um, sometimes I think there is really false, I don't know what's the word for it. People keep talking about the cost of fighting climate change. And people are not talking about the cost of not fighting it. And uh, yes, there's a cost associated with Paris Agreement. But if you're working against Paris Agreement, Paris Agreement, there's even greater cost. Just to think about very, very pragmatically, GM sells more cars to China than it sells cars here yeah. in US. And how will GM survive if China is facing out the gas, gas powered cars and GM is would not change. Will not make something not other than gas-powered cars. Will not make those yeah. uh, those changes. Mm -hmm. So I think it is. It's going to hurt us, not benefit us, if we don't work with the international agreement under well with all the other countries and to fight this global problem. Right. And it's uh, excellent that other countries do have a longer-term <laughs> phasing out plan, which which others can adopt and modify to fit their own societies and their own their own countries. So at least that's out there as a model and something to aspire to, mm -hmm. So, which I think is very important. Um, okay, um, has, um, I wanted to talk, move a little bit now to talk about precipitation, if, that, if, if, that's, if that's okay. Sure. Um, and I, there are probably studies that you would like to highlight for our viewers about increases and decreases and world varieties and precipitation that are, that are happening that are related to this whole issue of the gases that are holding, <laughs> uh, holding heat in. But I'll let you talk about that. And I think we have a slide too, don't we? Yes. Okay, yes. there's a slide about precipitation levels that should be coming up next. Um, the, Do we need to go back one? Yeah, the previous one. We need to go back one, please. Yes. Thank you, perfect. I think, um, yes, um, climate change Although people are talking about the global climate change, but man, it has all, the, all kinds of different local uh, manifestations. Mm -hmm. So I think I'll talk a little bit of the global change and then focus more on Dayton area Good. and or um, Ohio in, in general. Good. So basically, um, as you're starting this, we do have another call. Sure. So save that thought, and we're going to come back to this. Sure. But we would like to welcome our caller. We'd love to hear your question, and you're now on the air. Yes, I'm learning so much uh, from your show, uh, from your guest, the professor. Good. Um, I know that some cities, um, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, have decided to voluntarily uh, continue uh, participation in the Paris Climate Accord, um, even though um, President uh, Trump has, I suppose, indicated that the United States will not participate in the Accords. So my question has to do with Dayton and uh, cities 
in our part of Ohio, Dayton, Cincinnati, Columbus, uh, are any of those cities continuing uh, to participate uh, voluntarily in the Paris Climate Accord? Thank you very much. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get a response to your question. Thank you for calling in. Okay, I, I think, I hope you heard that. Several cities have decided they're going to work to, um, to fulfill the regulations and to abide by the regulations, even though as a, na as a nation, the federal may not. Um, and then he went on to ask, what about certain cities in Ohio? So I don't know the answers to any of those, <laughs> so I'll let you take, take that one. Um, I have not heard like okay. public, um, um, public. I say, I think like uh, announcement <laughs> and of um, and city government or state government in Ohio, but yeah, I think the short answer is I don't know either. Okay, but I think it makes makes a lot of business sense to continue with with the trend. Right. of developing mm -hmm. developing alternatives, alternatives. Mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah. and if cities can do it and then and measure it and then maybe they'll exactly. influence yes. exactly mm -hmm. I think yeah. I think that's uh, one advantage of the United States that we're not a centrally planned state right. yes and uh, locally people have a lot of say in how they want to develop how they want to pursue their business and there's a lot of individual freedom and uh, I think people should, um, should make choices based on what they think, what they believe right. would be for the benefit of our generation, our children's generation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you. All right. Now we're going back to precipitation. And it's interesting that you've, you, you've chosen, <coughs> the, the, the creator of this slide has chosen uh, two states in which I have both lived. My home state is Arkansas, and I do know that it's hot there in the summer months. So <laughs> let's let's hear our, our comparisons here. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, clim how climate will change for Ohio locally? And uh, so this is the um, this is um, this is a question a lot of people ask. And I really like this slide. I didn't make this. This is from the Union of Concerned Scientists, and they make that for actually for every state. And you, you can see that for the state of Ohio, and the temperature will all increase. So you get warmer, and we'll get warmer more in the summer than in the, uh, in the in winter. And then if you want some numbers, so by the end of this century, and the, uh, the summer temperature is likely to increase between 7 to 9 degrees Fahrenheit, and the winter is between 5 to 7. <coughs> in terms of precipitation, the precipitation actually um, did not change much for the summer, and it get it got wetter. It has has gotten wetter in the winter, and uh, the climate model projection for the future is we're looking at drier summers possible and uh, wetter winters. So if you combine if you combine the um, temperature and precipitation, so that's what the chart is nice is for. So basically, you're looking like hotter and drier summers, so your summer would be more like Arkansas. Mm. And then you're going to have warmer and wetter winters, and the winters were more like uh, Virginia and, um, and or even part of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So I think this slides illustrate very nicely because um, how climate change occurs, because a lot of times people don't interpret those numbers very well. They, for example, globally, the temperature has increased about uh, one degree um, Celsius, so that's about one and uh, one point eight degrees Fahrenheit mm. for the past one hundred and hundred and fifty years since we got um, um, instrument measurement. People often think one one and a half degrees. Mm. So what? But the thing is, we're talking about average temperature. Average temperature. It's a uh, then it's very different. In and I don't know whether you've um, heard the terms Little Ice Age. Mm -hmm. It is a period of relatively cold time um, between. Um, I think between the uh, until um, between eighteen. Uh, sorry. For. Uh, between 1600 to about 1800. 
So that's a period of relatively cold. And then the, before that is a relatively uh, warm, a couple of hundred years. We call the medieval warm period. Mm -hmm. So in, during the medieval warm period, that's the time when Vikings were very active, people settled in Greenland, and then um, Little Ice Age, you see river freezing in Netherlands, in those paintings, those Flemish paintings, people were skating, and nowadays the canals never freezes in the in Netherlands, and that time that even Thames freezes in winter. But the difference between medieval warm period and Little Ice Age, the average temperature, the difference is only about half degrees or less than one degree Celsius, uh, Fahrenheit. So we're talking about small changes in the, in the, in the average state is actually very big changes. Right, right, exactly. Okay. So when we talk about in the, in the future, by the end of the century, when we talk about like seven degrees Fahrenheit increase, and that's the temperature difference between now and the height of last ice age. Right. And uh, during the, about 20,000 years ago, the ice age, the, the, the ice sheet, the Laurentia ice sheet, go, went all the way to Dayton. Yes. Dayton was covered in ice, right. almost like year-round ice. And that's the difference. It was about seven degrees in Fahrenheit. Right. So that's the magnitude of climate change we're talking about. Right, and, which is absolutely an enormous. Yes. Absolutely so. All right, our next, our next slide then uh, takes us into... Um, but where does that, here we go. Oh, this is the yes, more about uh, the precipitation. Right. So in terms of precipitation, uh, there's a couple of things. Precipitation, the whole United States for the past 100 uh, or so years will have a slight change, about a uh, uh, slight increase. And uh, for Ohio, we're, t we're talking about about 2% per decade. Mm. And um, by the end of this century, we are probably t looking at about seven, seven to ten percent increase in average precipitation. But the thing with the precipitation is, the average precipitation increase, but the extreme precipitation increase a lot more, mm -hmm. a lot more. So <coughs> by mid-century, there's another uh, study I did by mid-century. So maybe in the next slide. Next slide, please. Yes. Good. So by mid-century, so that's uh, sort of like around 2050, and if you look at average temperature for Ohio, you are looking at 7 to 8 percent of change, but if we look at extreme storms, those are what we call the 25-year storm. That mm -hmm. means this storm occurs on average once what? every 25 years, and you're looking at about um, on average more than 20 percent increase. Of the 25-year storm. Of the 25-year storm. Okay. So the uh, climate change tend to increase these extreme events, right. like extreme storms, extreme precipitation, and at a much higher magnitude. Okay. All right. So then that kind of leads us into <coughs> talking a bit about our hurricanes, doesn't it? I mean, is that... Would you like to comment on the impact on, on the hurricane systems that we've been experiencing? Yes. Um, well, we, had, uh, we, have, we definitely have a very active uh, hurricane season mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. And um, hurricane is a, basically a low-pressure system, uh, low system mm -hmm. and it's like a heat engine that's developed on the ocean. And the fuel of hurricanes are the fuel of hurricanes is basically the warm water vapor, the water vapor that evaporated from the warm ocean surface. So when you have higher temperature of the ocean water, and you are, you're going to get stronger hurricanes. So that's, that's just the physics. That's why when hurricane, whenever a hurricane hit land, right, made mm. landfall, yes. it dissipates very quickly because it got cut off from the fuel from the ocean. And uh, there's no moisture, uh, moisture supply for the hurricane, the system, then it quickly dissipates. Right. So with the, uh, with the warmer climate, you're going to have a couple of, um, a couple of um, impacts. First of all, the ocean water is going to get warmer. And uh, that means there's a longer period of time in the year that we call the hurricane season 
that we're going to have a longer period where hurricane becomes possible. Right now, the hurricane season is basically defined as the temperature of the ocean reaches 80 degrees. That's deemed to be a critical temperature. And above that, hurricane become possible. Right. And so with warm water, you're going to have longer hurricane seasons. I think a couple of years ago, when we had the, uh, another, the previous active season, when we have Katrina and yes. Rita, the last hurricane we recorded were in January. We ran out of alphabets. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. And uh, so that was almost unheard of. And also, there's going to be wider area because of the warm, warmer ocean. And uh, so, for example, Hurricane Sandy, at that high latitude, yeah. you don't get, usually you don't get hurricanes because at that latitude, the water is not warm enough and to fuel, to yeah. fuel mm -hmm. this such a big hurricane. Mm -hmm. And then because of the warmer, warmer ocean, you're going to get more fuels and then you're going to get stronger hurricanes. And that's why we keep having this record-breaking hurricanes, even though not particularly in the Atlantic Ocean, but elsewhere in the Pacific, when we have like the typhoon or cyclones, they're, they're the same thing by different names. Yeah. Like uh, the, ty the typhoon called Haiyan, a couple of years ago, breaks the records of lowest, like the highest wind speed, lowest pressure recorded. And then there's another one um, that just occurred like last year. Can't remember the name from top of my head. But, um, but we're going to get, we are see, actually seeing stronger hurricanes. And a longer hurricane and season. And a lo longer yeah. hurricane season. Yeah. But there are a lot of uncertainties in there as well. And the biggest uncertainty is, are we going to get more? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're not sure how climate change will affect the frequency of hurricanes. But once it forms, because it has more fuel there, it's going to be stronger in terms of higher wind speed, higher precipitation, because there's more moisture in there. And, uh, and then, of course, it's going to cause more damage. Yes, because it's stronger. It's yes. completely stronger with water and winds. Well, let's talk a little bit uh, about the impact of climate change on, on agriculture and on, on human health. Um, uh, if we could just touch on that, because our time is racing. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, <laughs> so that touch it, it does. We're not done yet. We, we, we still have some time, but I just okay. want to, to, uh, to get through all of the interesting slides and topics we have down here. So let's sure. talk a little bit about, about agriculture. Agriculture, okay. And uh, agriculture, there are different aspects to agriculture. Mm -hmm. And initially people think, yes, plants take CO2 as, as a food for photosynthesis, mm -hmm. so an enhanced CO2 will have more, um, will have, or basically will increase the plant growth. And uh, that has been true for certain kind of plants, and so we call it the CO2 fertilization. So that's one aspect. So we're talking about the good things first. Mm -hmm. And then the other aspect is with temperature increase and uh, their longer growing season. And then there's early, uh, there's longer um, frost-free days. And all of these seem to promote uh, agricultural growth. Um, however, all of these are limited by many different factors. First of all, if you look at these charts, and this chart shows you basically the agricultural product production is increasing because of the technology and then um, we have better and better um, um, crop management. Mm -hmm. However, you see a lot of these dips. Yes. Those dips are caused by unusual climate events, the climate extremes. So some of them are caused by droughts, a lot of them droughts, floods, and... Uh, and then some temperature, some temperature extremes, mm -hmm. because higher extreme high temperature can also harm plants, yes. harm crops as mm -hmm. well. There's all there's an optimal range. You can't be too hot and too cold, and neither of them is good. So extreme climate uh, events, extreme climate disasters, still dominate the um, has a very dominant um, negative effects on agriculture and with climate change we're going to see more of it 
And in the past, there has been about 40% increase just in the past um, century about climate-related disasters. And this is going to show up in, temp uh, in agriculture as well. And also, with warmer temperature and warmer and wetter, it does not only promote crop growth, but also it promotes weeds yes. and insects. And all of these will limit, will, will limit the, the benefits that agriculture can receive from the agriculture. So there are different projections, but in general, people are still projecting negative impacts as a whole On from, from climate. These, all yes. of these factors coming together. I'm being yes. told we have another caller, so we're going to stop and take the call now. You're on the air. Thank you. Uh, just have one last uh, question for this fascinating show. Uh, this one, a very local question, uh, and I apologize if it is redundant. Uh, I've had some trouble with the live streaming uh, of the show tonight. But um, so my question is about the local impact um, of climate change and global warming. Uh, I, I have the impression that we've had just extraordinary rain um, in, in recent times and also straight line winds that have, not tornadoes, but in our neighborhood, straight line winds of incredible velocity that have uh, toppled trees in our neighborhood. And uh, so I'm just uh, curious about how the professor sees uh, the local impact of uh, climate change. Uh, and then I have a large, kind of a large question. Uh, I've read somewhere that the ozone hole uh, in the stratosphere is shrinking uh, recently. And I'm curious about why that would be. OK, thank you very much for your calls. The first part of his question, local impact, lots of rain mm -hmm. and lots of big straight winds coming through, not necessarily the tornado kind, but just straight hard winds. Um, I'm not familiar with the wind. So uh, I can talk about some <coughs> other local impacts mm -hmm. and precipitation is definitely one of them. And uh, the, um, in general, the precipitation in this area is going to increase, and as I showed before, and it will increase a lot more for extreme precipitations, like heavy rains. Heavy rain, and uh, we sometimes term this, it never rains it but pours. Mm -hmm. And uh, the heavy rains increase at, will increase disproportionately. And the local impact, we all know that Dayton, being at the confluence of three big rivers, is very prone to flooding. And uh, based on the increase of precipitation and some hydrological models, and it's, it shows that in the future, the 100-year flood is more likely to occur once every 30 years. So we're going to see a lot, of, uh, a lot more flooding and with the extreme if, um, impacts. And also, there's a different seasonal distribution of the rainfall. Mm -hmm. And um, we talk about it's likely to have to see decreasing rainfall in the summer mm -hmm. and increasing rainfall in, in winter. Wetter winters, in, yeah. yeah, wetter mm -hmm. winters. And uh, this is going to have implications for water qualities. And because the water quality in the if you have a lot of rain during the non-growing season, then the, those nutrients that had, did not have time to be taken up by the, by, the, um, by the plants is going to more likely be washed into the river. And actually, not only we have the, the local impact, so the nutrients get into the river will cause a phenomenon called eutrophication. It promotes algae growth and then the death of dec decomposition of algae will deplete the oxygen, right? So we have some of those episodes of algae bloom in places like Grand Lake St. Mary's and a couple of years back. And not only locally, this problem also will transfer downstream all the way to the Gulf. I don't know whether you've heard of this dead zone in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. It's basically the same thing, that algae bloom causes depletion of oxygen causes the dead zone. And actually, I just read about it that this year, we have a particularly large dead zone in the Gulf region. And the reason, the reason is because we have a particularly wet 
spring right. in the particular in the Midwest because we're a big agriculture state. Oh. Spring is a time when people put in, put in the fertilizer, right. but the plants haven't started growing yet. And then all these extra rain brings the nutrient all the way to the Gulf, creating this not only local water quality problem, but the water Ocean. quality problem Gulf. down the road. In the Gulf, in yes. the Gulf as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, very uh, dramatic kind of, um, uh, very dramatic kind of changes, obviously, that, that we have uh, going on here. Um, <clears throat> the issue seems so large and so global, which it certainly is. I think that some individuals feel a, a loss about what they can actually do to, to impact this. I'm one person. What can one person do in the face of warming oceans and um, stronger, bigger hurricanes and more 25-year events that are happening more frequently. So what would you, would you say to those types of questions? Well, people cause those problems. Yes. So each individual is part of that and people can deal with it. So um, I think there are a lot of websites um, talking about how we can do. So uh, making choices, reading, um, making choices of um, your utilities, your cars, make it more energy efficient. And uh, there, there, are many, there are many places we can see to give you ways to reduce, we call it carbon footprint. Yes. And, uh, but I know we always feel that as individual, there's very limited thing we can do. So I think, I think the one thing we can do, if we, th we feel that as an individual that we, we don't have enough strength, we can organize. We really need to organize and then get, in, get actively involved. And, uh, and coming from a different background, I have a very, at least I have a very, some people say naive, but I think a very fresh appreciation of a wonderful system here that we call democracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, democracy does not, they say democracy does not get guarantee the best, but it gets you what you deserve. So get involved and get actively participate. So I think that's what we can do. Okay. And um, if, I, if I can have a few like closing remarks. Oh yes, exactly. Do we that's, have time for that's that? That's where we're coming to right now. You're right with me. <laughs> okay. And uh, I, by nature, I'm an optimistic person. And I don't like, um, like whenever people, often people talk about climate change and then very often people descend into like um, um, gloom and Doom. Doom, yes. yes. Uh, it was uh, gloom and doom. And uh, I mean, I don't blame them. There are things that get frustrated. But I, I think it is a very false dichotomy to depict fighting climate change against economic growth. Mm -hmm. And as if, if we, if we accept Paris uh, Agreement, if we agree to do something, and it's going to be almost like austerity measure that we're going to impose a very harsh life on ourselves. We're going to, we're going to, um, uh, we're going to lose jobs and the economy will suffer. That's just simply not true. I think people should embrace it as an opportunity. And fighting climate change is closely related to a whole revolution of our energy structure. And this, this revolution is coming, whether you like it or not. And because fossil fuels are going to run out in this generation or at most next generation. And um, just don't be, don't be on the wrong side of history. And just imagine, imagine the industrial in revolution when people discover the wonders of petroleum, the wonders of, co of coal. And do you want to stick with your horse and the buggies? Mm. And now it's the same thing. And we are going to run out of, run out of this fo fossil fuel, which is causing huge damage to our environment. And uh, we are running into this, this, this whole war over there. Are you going to run into this war at full speed? Or are you going to take initiative to change course? Yeah. It's just going to be so much painful if we're going to be forced to change rather than take the initiative and take, the, take what we have to make the change 
on on our make own. It an opportunity. Yes, exactly. Look at the opportunity. Exactly. Portion. Thank you very much. This has been a very interesting <coughs> program. I thank you for coming on and sharing um, your research and your um, scholarly knowledge about this really important topic. So thank you very much. Thank I you for having it. me. And thanks to the viewers for watching and for calling in and participating in the program. Good night.